Okay. But at the time I was speaking law, I feel I had more of a sense of justice than money. Uh, Chat GPT, what it will do, it will give you the basic, mm-hmm. right? But you see, a contract is supposed to be specific to your issue, your industry, the work at hand. Yeah. And there will be some things that Chat GPT can't foresee. Yeah. That's what a lawyer does for you. Hey guys, welcome back to Financially Incorrect. I am your host, Barack, and this podcast is sponsored by FX Pesa. Please do remember to check out their links. Um, they're in Forex right now. If you are suffering with a Kenya shilling or other local currencies, you might be able to find dollar solutions um, with FX Pesa. So please do check them out. Uh, remember, this podcast is around financial, I guess, literacy as a whole. We are trying to talk about very serious financial topics, but in a very cheeky way. And try and have fun as 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 we do it as well. Um, this is, I think, our third or fourth episode of the year. Lost track now. And today I have um, Liz Langer with me, an African intellectual property lawyer who wears many hats, sits on at least one tri- tribunal. I was going to say a couple, but I know at least one, um, a couple of boards. Lives in Malindi now. I think you're at the stage of what they call a self actualization. Um, <laughs> lives in Malindi. Um, she came in Nairobi yesterday for a couple of board meetings, and she was like, "Yeah, I'll stop by financially incorrect and and see how we are doing." Welcome, Liz. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Let me first of all shout out your outfit, um, and more specifically your tie. We're having a chat just before this. In my older career as a lawyer, I also collected multiple ties, and Liz was telling me that her tie is older than than I am. Yeah. Um, as old as as as, 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 <laughs> as her, she got it from her dad. Yeah, it yeah? used to be one of my dad's ties. Yeah. yeah, he passed on. So these are some of the things I I just remember. You know, when someone passes on, then you remember and reflect the kind of influence they had in your life. Yeah, and I know my style. I got my style from my dad. Yeah, so I even realize even the poses I make. I'm like, yeah, this is so my dad. When someone asks you at the time, you're like, like that used to be my dad's thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's it's, it's subconscious. Yeah, yeah it's subconscious. It? No, yeah. no, it's subconscious. It's yeah. later on, like when my husband pointed that, I was like, "Oh, yeah, I used to see daddy do that." So. <laughs> yeah, I think we 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 all do those things. Yeah, and I, I try to look like money as well. Even the, yeah. it's the sweater, everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> do you dress like this in 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 Malindi? No, in Malindi, I do a more laid back, um, you know, outfits. More summer. Yeah. Try to be professional and playful. But yeah. You know, my I just I run my office from Malindi, but my HQ is Nairobi. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so everything is digitally. So okay, I have uh, fi- uh have fashion freedom. Yeah. To wear as I feel. <laughs> as you feel on that specific day. Yeah. Okay. So before we get into it, um, today um um is uh, Bloomberg released an article um today saying that the Kenyan currency is the second worst performing currency in Africa, as at. January 2024. How does that make you feel as a Kenyan paying all these taxes? You guys, I don't even understand. Yeah. Like, it, it makes me feel sad and confused. And I think for me, the day I knew it was, things were bad. Um, just two weeks ago, I was in Addis for the Hub of Africa Fashion Week. Yeah. And I went to one of their local markets, Shiromeda, to buy some clothes. Mm-hmm. And then when they told me the price and I withdrew chums, I was like, when I checked the bank balance, I was like, wait a minute, are you telling me the beer is stronger than the Kenyan shilling? Yeah. I was in shock. Then when I went online, we were at 160 against the dollar. Yeah. I was like, bus. We are in so trouble. now in my mind, for someone who also, I have to invest in my business, mm-hmm. um, a chunk of my clients are usually foreigners. Mm-hmm. That means a lot of foreign travel. Mm-hmm. For a while, I used to have the comfort that the Kenya shilling is doing well. Like mm-hmm. at least in the African I can, yeah, context, I can yeah. feel like my sweat versus how much I'm making. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not doing so badly. Yeah. But now I'm worried. Honestly, mm-hmm. I'm worried. Yeah. In terms of the investments I'm looking at to make this year, mm-hmm. I'm like, yo, I better make some money back. Yeah. And, and now I'm like, I have to start charging maybe in dollars. Yeah. And figure that out. Yeah. But I won't lie. It's it's scary. It also means I. I am a fan of luxury goods, mm-hmm. so now I have to cut down. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, that means on, my on jewelry, that. bags, right. clothes. Right. I have to figure that out. Yeah, you know, and, and you know that's therapy, man. That's how you go through the hard times, or at least I do. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, and, and they're projecting that you know by the end of the year it can get to two ten. I think Collins was saying that the, some analysts were saying that by mid year it could get to one eighty, and um, yeah, this morning I was 
my I was googling myself and I was like what does what does Kenya need to do to change the trajectory yeah. of the USD against the Kenyan shilling and I don't really you know don't think I've quite fully understood understood what what exactly we need to do but yeah. um yeah it's it's, it's I really it's, hope it's that bad. someone will do like an article or people will yeah. just say you know what if Gaba did 1 2 3 yeah then maybe it would make sense because i feel like sometimes we are also always just criticizing government but we never give solutions yeah, i think yeah. it's time we started giving solutions yeah. so you know whoever is you know financially up that's listening or watching today i i hope they do something they help yeah. us i yeah that that's true actually and and i i i don't know i don't know i guess we'll see and hopefully we make it to to the end of the year just fine right we keep praying <laughs> so yeah let's get into it i guess let's get into your story um how did you get into law in the first place uh well when i was a kid mm-hmm. i wanted to be an artist an all-rounded musician singer dancer actor the whole shebang um but of course nobody believed in the arts my mm-hmm. parents were very skeptical especially my mom mm-hmm. Um so why course, were they skeptical? They didn't see any money and then mm-hmm. of course for any mom who has a teenage daughter mm-hmm. they are always thinking entertainment equals promiscuity and half nakedness and no. all these things. Is it not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it depends on how you package yourself, you know? But you see unfortunately because that's yeah. what sells, that's yeah. all people see. Like they yeah. don't see the other more professional put together right. artists right. and what not. So it wasn't something that they were willing to entertain at some point i toyed with journalism mm-hmm. journalism was like it was either journalism or law at some point um w- the, the time i thought i wanted to be a lawyer i was seeing a lot of injustices when i would watch the news mm-hmm. and you can see you know either it's a rape issue someone has been mugged and i was like what's wrong with the system maybe i'll be a lawyer you know and whenever i tell my folks that i think that's what they really took to heart mm-hmm. So um when Catholic University uh, had introduced law it's my mom who saw it in the newspapers mm-hmm. I was at Alliance doing French I was doing my diplôme de langue mm-hmm. then my mom calls and she says eh, have you seen the newspapers like I've not yet seen the newspaper until I come home and she says Catholic University has introduced law so you have to figure out how you go and get your results sleep okay <laughs> and after that my mom was with me bumper to bumper and did, you, not, did you not want to explore University of Nairobi um so because I the threshold for university in Nairobi uh, was really okay. high yeah uh, but at least i had qualified right, so right, but right. now you see you know you're competing with all these mm, other yeah, so uh, job cuz at, at our time we had what was called job i i don't so, know job so um job was like the top performing students so okay. you get to the public university you're sponsored cuz you have that top mark ah uh, right right uh, yeah then now the rest if you qualified but you know so you can enter para or something ah uh, right right the classes right. up to capacity with the job students yeah 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 so when Kathol came my mom was like we are doing this it's like uh, give me time to think maybe yeah. i might want to journalism i was like no 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 this so is i was like okay <laughs> do you think do you think um in any way sort of form their drive for you to pursue this was financially driven actually no cuz i think they had seen that passion mm-hmm. um and i think for me at that time i was also i was like 50 50 you know when you're just fresh from high school you just want a taste of the world mm-hmm and everyone is giving you their opinion and there's also how now you you see life mm-hmm. after school you know you're watching news like honestly at the time news anchors were so shiny to me so I was like right. oh I want right. I might want right. to be an anchor right. but then I remembered when I was in high school one time I tried to do a, a screen test mm-hmm. and I was like I, I the pressure of just reading news was much so I was yeah. like okay well, maybe we'll just do law. let's see let's yeah. see what what law will do okay um so I was flexible um So even their push wasn't really like financially financially driven for yeah, you to Yeah, for pursue. me it was in 3D. Yeah. It there there was an element of prestige for sure. Mhm. Um for me when I used to see I hear lawyers. I had not even interacted with a lawyer at the mm-hmm. time ever. But you know watching Ali McBeal mm-hmm. again my age is showing. <laughs> <laughs> I, watched I watched Boston League. I watched you Boston League. You know and I you know Boston watching Ligo, the guys, yeah. like the likes of like Eugene and what not just seeing how they carry themselves how they dress. It's like okay. I think I can do this. Yeah. Yeah. I actually think Boston legal is better than than suits. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, suits. Oh, Collins, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> suits. Have you watched Boston legal Shiko? Do you know what Boston legal is? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's uh, much better yeah, honestly. Yeah. Like when I teach my students, I yeah. always tell them, please disregard suits. The legal <laughs> profession is nothing. Yeah. Cuz yeah. like sometimes even when your students are writing 
their arguments, right. you can see the heavy specter in them trying to come through. Like, no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that's not that's not how you get the point across. You know? Right, yeah, right. Even, even when they address you, right. they're trying to, you know, chest thumb, yeah, move their ego that, around. Yeah. Like, Boss, no, yeah. we, it's about mutual respect. Wow, <laughs> interesting. Okay. Um, so, I mean, if... And, and um, I guess I'm not driving this point home in terms of like I just I don't want it to be purely like a financial thing. But mm-hmm. what do you then think your 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 parents taught you about um, money? Was it important for you to be able to? Because if you're saying you initially wanted to pursue like a more creative career, and they were like, mm, no, was it a fear of you will not be able to sustain yourself? Um, and you know pay your bills, etc, etc, or was it more of, you know, if, if, if you pursue a more stable um, career or stable industry, then you'd be able to achieve a lot more financial success, like your, I guess your trajectory and potential is, is a lot higher. Well, I think with my folks, we never had like money conversations per se, mm-hmm. but I just used to watch how my parents would tiptoe around finances and okay. whatnot. Um, and I always wondered how it felt to be rich. Okay. But at the time I was speaking law, I feel I had more of a sense of justice than money. Then when I started studying law and learning about, you know, the kind of numbers that, you know, lawyers are making in terms of bank, I was like, oh, okay, okay, I see, I see. Maybe I can, mm-hmm. I can do it. I, that's what I want. Um, I thought I would be a human rights lawyer mm-hmm. at first. Then I realized it was very crowded, mm-hmm. too many human rights guys. I was like, how will I stand out? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, with Katho, we had a lot of, um, and we had a lot of ent- entertainment activities, mm-hmm. cultural day, whatnot, Miss Katho. So I, I tried that out. Then I was Miss Katho. Mm-hmm. Then with that, I started doing a lot of mainstream modeling, mm-hmm. um, had a record deal, fell mm-hmm. flat, but... I, it was a, an awesome learning curve. For what me. happened? The contract. Yeah. The contract was a mess. Mm-hmm. Um, and just looking at how the ecosystem also was not prepared in terms of legal understanding. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why when you look at um, in the mid 2000s when we had a lot of the pop star type of shows and competitions, mm-hmm. you know, most of them never thrived because it's understanding the legality. Mm-hmm. You know, the reason why the pop idols and the voice are really strong. It's because of the kind of contracts that they have and how they deal with artists. And also they, they commit to what they promise. Mm-hmm. We didn't have that. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, mm-hmm. We had cases of winners are promised something and it, it they falls don't get through, it. Right. never happens. So that's what happened in our situation. And in in your contract, are you looking at this from uh, as you're a student, with, you know, a legal student with legal student eyes, or do you have a lawyer who's... At the Looking time, at it. legal. It was a student with legal eyes. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. and when the we had we had been recording for like six months, no contract, right? Mm-hmm. So I we went we were a girl group. So mm-hmm. I tell my fellow girls, I'm like, hey, we need to tell our manager we need a contract. So we hired our manager. She pushes, pushes. We get the contract. I look at the contract. I'm like, guys, this contract is not making sense. Mm-hmm. I had my pencil. I mm-hmm. had notes. Mm-hmm. So we actually even requested for a meeting with a lawyer. Mm-hmm. And then we realized the contract was missing words like copyright ownership, mm-hmm. uh, you know, issues of distribution. Like there were some things that were missing. Yeah. Um, so I figured hey, this contract is not, it doesn't feel like it mirrors the industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, because of how they had been, you know, dragging the project, there was that, we could see something wasn't right. Yeah. So I think even them, the investor had changed their mind and whatnot. But for me, at least, it, it shed some light in terms of the hard work that the artists are always putting into yeah. their work, into their craft. Because yeah. you can imagine you're recording until like 5 a.m. Yeah. Then at 8 a.m. I'm in class. Because mm. we had times like that, you know, you've been booked a slot. The, there was yeah, one the time we, were, we yeah. were recording with Homeboys. Musyox was with Homeboys at the time. Mm-hmm. And he was one of the most sought after producers, yeah. right? So there's, he had a whole timetable of artists. Yeah. So you get the slot that's available. And yeah. our slot was like, uko midnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so after everyone, so we, we get there early, you carry your homework, uh, your assignments, do them somewhere, whatever, as, yeah. as you're seeing these other celebs, checking in, record, leave, and whatnot. Strike conversations with some of them. So that really, for me, was, it's the kind of experience that money will never buy. Yeah. Because... At the same time, when I would meet them, I'd be like, yeah, so, so and so, why don't you have, do you have a lawyer? Why don't you have a lawyer? So we'd have those conversations. 
And that's how now my love for IP was born. Okay. Because I was like, if you're here until like 5 a.m., why are you not rich? Yeah. And people are in the club dancing. Yeah. You know, we are watching music shows yeah. and whatnot. It's like something, something is not right. Yeah. So for me, I was like, then that's where I want to be. Yeah. And to figure out why is it not right? Make sure the money is in the right pockets. Yeah. And the economy makes sense. The creative economy makes sense. Okay. Yeah. There's two things you've said I want to ask you about. One, which is the, why are you being paid um, at this time when you're recording for the six months? Why are you being paid any money at all? We were waiting for the money, which never came. So, <laughs> so you were recording in faith? We were recording in faith. Okay. And okay. Um, I remember that time, I was like, I could walk away mm -hmm. and never learn from anything here. Mm -hmm. Or I stick it out yeah. and see what happens. Yeah. So I said, let me stick it out and see what happens. I will, I will get something out of it. It may not be money, but I will get something out of it. So for me, I was flexible. I was loose. Okay. <laughs> and the second thing is, this is the second time you've, 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 you've used the word rich. And the first time you're talking about, um, you, you, you wondered, I guess when you're growing up, you wondered what it was like to be rich. What, what do you think made you even think about that? Did you, did you think that you guys were not rich? Well, you know, African parents, they're mm -hmm. always frugal. Mm -hmm. So it's always about bargaining. In my head, I'm mm -hmm. like, if you're rich, you don't bargain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's at the time. Mm -hmm. Now later on, I learned that millionaires are the, are the guys who bargain like mad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but at that time, yeah. that was my perception of being rich. Mm -hmm. I rock into a shop, mm -hmm. like, oh, this is 5,000. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, and here's a tip. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Where do you think that came from? Was it movies I think or movies. just your imagination? Movies and imagination. Yeah. Um, like one of the shows I really like to watch at the time was like Sex and the City and seeing mm -hmm. that flashy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So I think in my mind, you know, seeing yeah, like those why characters... Is, why isn't your mom not going yeah, to stores like, and why just... Why are you not... <laughs> <laughs> why are you not buying us clothes, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think for me... And, and then there was this thing when we were kids, you know, like when I was a kid, our parents were the kinds who'd go buy fabric, they come and make clothes for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in my mind, I was like, Kwani, we are broke. What? <laughs> Now when I think about it, yeah. I actually want to learn how to sew. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I get outfits and garments and I want to alter or just yeah. make something from scratch. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, I should have paid attention when my mom was on the sewing yeah. machine. <laughs> Interesting. So so what do you think then your I guess if you look back now, what do you think your parents taught you about money? I know you've already said you didn't have any direct conversations. Yeah. But indirectly, what do you think they, they taught you about money? They taught me about saving, mm -hmm. uh, how to use money prudently. Um, and just making sure you have money for a rainy day. Okay. That you, 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 you never find yourself in a situation where you don't have money. Yeah. And you don't have to beg. Yeah. So that's the one thing I'm, I'm, I think also that fear is what makes me work hard. That fear <laughs> of I can be broke and yeah. I have to call someone and I'm like, boss, okay, I need 10 Gs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just seeing how my folks really worked hard mm -hmm. and they were multitaskers. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom was a nurse, they had a chemist mm -hmm. and she was doing all these other courses and trying to better herself. My mm -hmm. dad was in pharmacy and then he also had a pharmacy, a pharmacy on the side. Mm -hmm. So just seeing that. Mm -hmm. So I also learned how to multitask from my parents. Okay. So at this point, moving the story back, at this point you've sort of, you're sort of getting an, you know, interest in... Um, the creative space and the IP around that. When do you, and you're still in law school, when do you start earning um, your own money? When do you make your first, I guess, I don't know whether it was a salary, whether it was a payment, whatever the case is. Yeah. After, after I graduated, because mm -hmm. um, with law, you, when you get an LLB, you're just a lawyer. Yeah. Then you get, when you go to Kenya School of Law, you become an advocate of the high court, yeah. which means now you can practice, you can use the advocate's remuneration order, like, you know, you're more structured yeah. and you're fully baked. They like to say <laughs> right, it. <laughs> right, right. You're, you're now a learned, a learned friend. Yeah, you're now a learned friend. Right. Um, so for me, it was after campus. Um, I worked with a few management type of organizations. Mm -hmm. So just the little legal I would advise in, with, from a marketing perspective, mm -hmm. did something. Then eventually worked briefly with uh, a CM, with two CMOs, okay. mostly on the comms side. Because for me, I could see the challenge was also our artists didn't understand the law. Mm -hmm. Someone was not addressing how um, artists or the Wanjiko in the creative sector understood the law. Mm -hmm. So I was helping them now to package 
copyright information to make it make sense to them so that then they understand why the CMOs are important. Mm-hmm. So that's where I started and then for our listeners can you give us the definition of CMOs? CMO so collective <laughs> yes. management organization. Yeah. But pro- popularly referred to as MCSK, Music yeah. Corporate Society of Kenya, uh PRISC, Performance Rights Society of Kenya and CAMP. Yeah. Kenya Association of Music Producers. And these are entities that exist um, to administer copyrights on behalf of artists in uh, spaces or in uh, exploitation where they can't. For example, broadcast. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense for an artist to go and knock at KBC and say, hey, you played my song, give me five Gs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what CMOs do now. They regulate and ensure that now the artists are paid. So they negotiate on their behalf, get this money. And then the artists, the okay. rights holders are paid. That's what they are yeah. supposed to do. So when when you start, I guess, consulting for for these organizations, how much are they? How much are they paying you? How much are you making? What are you doing with that money at that point? Um. So I got married young. Mm-hmm. So for me already, then it was paying the nanny, mm-hmm. uh, making sure that I can buy some nice things for my son. Mm-hmm. I can do some stuff in the house and try and save some. Right. But it wasn't a lot. So right. after you've paid the nanny, done some shopping, yeah. <laughs> that was it. And that's yeah. when I knew I had to do more or do better, push myself harder. Right. Yeah. In the in the um, in this space. And at that time, I mean, what did it look like in terms of for the future at that mm-hmm. time? Did you feel optimistic that um you know uh, it would open up? Did you feel optimistic that the entertainment space would open up and the, and the creative space as a whole that would allow you to be able to generate more money? Because I'm assuming when you, when now, I guess reality is hitting you. And this, I'm basing my my question off of what I see artists complaining about um, with the amount of money that they are paid for their annual fees. You know, you get, yeah. I think, an MPESA for 3,000 bob or 2,000 bob. When you're seeing that, are you feeling depressed? You're like... I was actually oh, my optimistic. To make my money? Yeah. I was very optimistic because I could see the opportunities that Kenyan artists were missing out on because mm. they didn't understand their rights. See, like, for example, synchronization rights. Your song mm. is used in a film or in an advert. That's money. Mm. But some artists didn't understand that. Um, and I had the privilege of also being um, an, an, an entertainment writer. Mm-hmm. I used to write for True Love when I was in uni. Like mm-hmm. I said, me as a multitasker. Yeah, I can so see. So I used to do all the celebrity columns. Right. So for me, I had hope because I had, I had access to all these celebrities I had interviewed mm-hmm. from music and film. So there are the guys now when I decided I don't want to do the CMO thing anymore, just went on my phone book, called so and said, like, hi, how are you? It's been a while. How have you been? What mm-hmm. are you up? Oh, I saw you're releasing a new album. Hey, so what are your contracts looking like? Conversation. Mm-hmm. And that's how. And then they now invite me to events, to speak. And now the more I did that now, the more now I was visible. Right. And then, of course, my blog as well, talking about current affairs in the creative space. Right. Who is missing money? Where? What could they have done better? Talk about such things. So that visibility helped. Okay. Now, when, when artists would have opportunities, uh, I'd be one of the first people they call. And say, hey, Liz, I have a contract. Can you have a look? And then some like, oh, I have only 24 hours. I'm like, bro, no one gives you 24 hours unless they're holding a gun to your head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, tell them you need three days. Three yeah. days, your lawyer will revert. Yeah. And then, pole pole, that's how we built. Okay. Yeah. I want to ask you a little bit about, I guess, um, maybe shed some context because I've heard you talking about even with, the, I guess, the talent shows that existed here before, what was lacking was the legal framework. Um, so I want to try and distinguish between the business framework and what's mm-hmm. required for the business to function and the role that the legal framework plays and how the legal framework enables, um, uh, I guess, people who own any sort of copyright or intellectual uh, property and how they're able to generate more money and why for you, um, you feel like that's what's missing. So for the longest time, when people are having legal conversations, it's yeah. always like in a silo. It's in isolation, not in collaboration with. Uh-huh. And that's what I think uh, people need to understand. That in any business that you're doing, it's not the business and the law. The law is in the business. Like it's a fusion, uh-huh. right? For anything to be successful, you have to also appreciate the law. Case in point, you're, you're in marketing, uh-huh. right? You create a brand. There's no way you will invest in pushing this brand if you don't know if it's, if, if it's actually something you can assert a right, which would be a trademark. Mm-hmm. Do you know if it's available? There are trademark uh, laws and regulations. You want to register it as a trademark. Is it available? Is it making sense? Is it descriptive? 
um, if it's a made up word, could it have some weird connotations in another local dialect or language? Mm-hmm. All those things. So you, you shouldn't put money in before you have actually verified that it's something that should be available. Right. So in marketing, uh, even the the chance the time I had chance to be an in house counsel, mm-hmm. we for me I used to be very sad that marketing would go and just do their things and they come back firefight for firefighting and they're like, Oh, this happened, like uh, we've been here. You know where our office is. Mm-hmm. Why did you guys sign this deal without even coming to ask? Mm-hmm. Like that would have been a five minute conversation, mm-hmm. you know? So it's just understanding that they work together. So back to the talent shows, right? Mm-hmm. Um, say you have a show, you want to get some pop stars in, they'll market your music, mm-hmm. their, your product, mm-hmm. they get their music in and la la la. You're sponsoring, of course, you make some royalties, all the events they'll go to, they'll always be talking about your, your company. <laughs> So it's the contracts. So you're putting in your money. How are you putting in the money? And how does this industry um, enable you to recover your, your investment mm-hmm. back? It's a different game, right? Because music is it's almost like a long game sometimes because mm-hmm. it will depend on what's hot, what's not, and what not, right? So once you understand that, you're able to make the right decisions, have the right contracts. So it's, it's a mix of both. You also have, you manage your expectations, because if you're going to invest in the music industry and expect to get returns within a year, mm-hmm. then probably not. It might take another two or three mm-hmm. years, depending on also you understanding how you're going to market mm-hmm. this talent mm-hmm. that you're investing in. So you see, it's a whole situation so that we're able to tell you, oh, this is not possible because um, if they sign with a record label, then this is what you would lose out mm-hmm. because then you, you'd be viewed more of a manager than an investor. Right. You know, like all that stuff. Right. And that's the, the whole ecosystem. Okay. <laughs> um, you've just talked about, I guess, working in-house for um, council. So in your, I guess, career journey, mm-hmm. um, you stop working for the CMOs, like you mentioned. Then where do you go after that? So after that, uh, I became a consultant now. Okay. Uh, I realized also you're able to be more influential as an independent thinker mm-hmm. than when you're in the system. Mm-hmm. Um, so the minute I realized that, I was like, I packaged myself as a consultant. Mm-hmm. So then I still consulted for these CMOs. And then um, I joined uh, JGIP with mm-hmm. John Gashui, mm-hmm. notable IP lawyer as mm-hmm. well, also a recording artist. Mm-hmm. So I worked with her. And then, I mean, working with her now really, really opened my eyes and mm-hmm. exposed me to so much more. And just seeing how she would work and interact with all these areas of IP that opened my eyes, mm-hmm. and then eventually I was like, "Okay, I want to be my own boss." Mm-hmm. And then, <laughs> and then you then you then stepped out, and then started. Yeah, I, I guess out. started your own thing. Yeah. And and I mean, has have have you ever? I guess in in, in your career experience, have you ever? Ex- um, and even yeah, albeit you got married young, have you ever been in a point where what you were doing wasn't making you enough money for what you required? Yeah. Um, even just in uni when I was writing. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a time that money wasn't enough. Yeah. And especially when, when now True Love, they stuffed the, the, the South African company folded and then it, they licensed the franchise to a Kenyan company. Mm-hmm. It wasn't doing as well. So the money I used to make shrunk. Mm-hmm. I was like, yo, <laughs> can you imagine you taking a bus to go all the way to Hallingham mm-hmm. just to collect a paycheck for three Gs? It wasn't making sense. Yeah. Yeah, so I was like, and it, it, it was three Gs. Now, what had it come? What had it come from? Just one article. Yeah, um, one of those. No, I mean, what were they paying you before? I guess before. Oh, they, before, before they, that, the, yeah. the small articles were about five k. Yeah, and then the bigger articles were ten, fifteen k. Yeah, and then if you did like a cover story, you'd earn about twenty five. Mm. Yeah. And back then, that was like some good that money. That was, uh, yeah, I, I guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> back then, <laughs> that was, yeah. Uh, what do you think? I mean. For you as as Liz, what do you think you've done if you were to, I guess, try and look back retrospectively, what do you think you've done in spaces where you haven't made enough money, where you're not making enough money? What's your, almost like your body reflex? Like what's the thing that you begin to do when you find yourself in that space? Uh, So first, cut back on any expenditure. Mm -hmm. And then second, it's now network like crazy. The little I have, 
Mm-hmm. I'd be like, okay, so what's happening on the ground? Where do mm-hmm. I need to be? Who do I need to meet? Mm-hmm. That's what now I would do. Yeah. Has that worked every single time? Almost. Yes. Because it's always, like I said, it's always about packaging. Yeah. When you understand who you're speaking with and what their needs are, then mm-hmm. you flip it. You could, you could be talking about business and then you sneak in some legal issues. Yeah. Like, yeah, by the way, do you, do you, have you thought about one, two, three? And you could do, do you have a trademark? Do you have this? Oh, and have you registered your copyright? <laughs> yeah. And then like, oh, okay. The next thing you know, two weeks later, you get a call. Oh, you remember? You talked to me about this. I just realized we have some material we developed. I think we need some copyright. And I think we might have a trademark thing. Mm-hmm. I'll have marketing or my people call you. Mm-hmm. Okay. How have you how have you convinced your the clients that you've worked with to whether it's take up legal services or whether it's registering a trademark or doing anything that they need to do um, with regard to um, securing the intellectual property? Because I guess many times it seemed it, it's looked at as an add on, yeah. and it's like, is it really worth putting the money that I need to into getting some of these things done? So how do you convince your clients to you know to actually do that and be like, yeah, spend money on this; it will be worth it at the end of the day. It's always first understanding the client's end game. Mm -hmm. And then for those who may not be, for lack of a better phrase, um, exposed, um, showing or demonstrating the the potential they have. Mm -hmm. And say, you know, if you moved from here to here, then you are likely to compete with, if it's a fashion client, I'll be able to tell them, maybe you could be the next Gucci, Mm -hmm. but you need to do one, two, and three. Um, so we, I have used a lot of case law as conversation, like just basic conversation, like, oh, you're in fashion. Oh, you don't have a trademark. Why don't mm-hmm. you have a trademark? And, and like with fashion guys for the longest, right now I think fashion is now picking up and appreciating IP, mm-hmm. but they used to, I would have clients walk in and they say, Liz, why do I need you when Givenchy and Prada and all these other brands are being knocked off in the Kenyan market? Mm-hmm. Why do I need you? And I say, are they broke? I'm like, no, they're not mm-hmm. because they have a strategy. Mm-hmm. Kenya may not be in their strategy right now, but those guys are minting serious dollars. Yeah. And, I, and then I will talk to them and I say, okay, look, with this brand like Levi's, why is Levi's still the leading uh, jean brand? Mm-hmm. They have a trademark. They have all these things in place. That's how you know these jeans. What is your, what is your X factor as a fashion designer, yeah. as a fashion brand? And we're like, okay, mm, I can see, I can see. Right. And then pole pole, it, it makes sense. Now they come back and they say, okay, I found my X factor. Is this protectable? We go and register. Make sure now they have their contracts as well. Again, creative economy, we, we had a lot of informality, mm-hmm. right? It was always you guy, my guy, shake hands. Mm-hmm. And then when money comes, the drama ensues, right? Mm-hmm. So now when you also have those conversations, they're like, you know what? If you negotiate now, because right now we're talking about an unknown, you're in a better situation to agree. Mm-hmm. As opposed to when money comes and then we start saying, no, 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 Barack, mm. I'm the one who wrote 80% of the song. I, yeah. des- I deserve all the money. Yeah. If we have it from the beginning and we've agreed, we've collaborated, we're able to say, okay, I deserve 50%, you deserve 50% because you also came with some soft investment right. or whatever, you know. Um, so giving those examples and sharing with them, see, helping them sing the long game. Yeah. For, for anyone who, I guess, starting a business or wants to, or whatever, um, and is doing anything around intellectual property. At what point is what, what's the right point to, you know, register a trademark or beginning to have those conversations because it does cost money. Yeah. Um. So what's the right within within a business's journey? What's the right point to get something like beginning. that done at the beginning? At the beginning, because that's the identity of the business. So you think? That's I mean, if answer. I have two hundred, three hundred thousand to start my business, that I should spend one hundred and fifty thousand to to register. Um, my, my trademark. So here's the thing. First of all, we need to stop looking at IP protection and legal services as a liability in yeah. a business. Because that's always the general approach business people will have. Like, yeah. I'm spending money on legal. Yeah. But you're spending money on marketing. You're spending money on a new office, a new desk, new suits. Yeah. Like, so what's the difference between that and law? And yet law is the fundamental to make sure that your business will be sustainable. It will... It will um, you know, it will live longer. It will be a legacy. Mm-hmm. You will never have legal drama. Yeah. Yeah. Because as you're, you're as you're spending on marketing, it's on these um, intangible assets that you haven't protected that you're spending them on, and you don't know if you even have them to begin in the first. You know, you don't you don't have them in the first place because yeah. you've not asserted those rights. Yeah. And how do you assert? You register, right? So, like I said, for example, you come up with a brand and then you quickly push to marketing. 
And then later on, you're told, oh, my friend, you, you get a season disease. Your brand is confusing our consumers. Stop using. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you have billboards. You have done this fabulous event. Mm -hmm. You have flyers walking, you know, distributed left, right, and center in town. And then now you want to start telling your clients, oh, uh, we are rebranding. Yeah. That's too mic <laughs> down the drain yeah. in marketing. Save yourself that heartache, that drama, so that from the beginning you know what is my uh, X factor, what is my product, what am I you know, pushing to the world or to the Kenyan audience. I protect that so that now I can work with it confidently and yeah. say, I am selling this. Yeah. I know it's mine. Like yeah. If anyone came at me, I can actually fight and defend myself, yeah. defend this right. Okay. I mean, definitely it sounds like you're well and truly <laughs> well-versed and competent in this space. Um, how, in terms of your personal survival, in terms of the way that you make your daily bread, the way that you make your money mm -hmm. um, in order to invest in things like that, what's that business landscape like right now for an IP lawyer? Um, how are you making your money primarily if you were to sort of break down where your revenue sources are coming from right now? What, what does that look like? So the, the Kenyan creative economy has been doing really well. Uh -huh. you know, you've been, we've, we've had a lot of um, investor interests in, in the Kenyan space, especially in music, in film, in software development. Um, and of course, the good thing is when there's foreign interest also, they always ask them, so do you have a lawyer? Uh -huh. uh, and, and one thing I really appreciate with foreigners, and I think... Um, in Swahili, we say, Asha kumsi matusi. Like, uh -huh. the truth should not be seen as, a, as an insult. Yeah. But we need to be more honest with our people, right? Because um, there, there will be instances where you come to me, and, and we are friends, right? And you tell me you want to buy land. And then I, I tell you, yeah, 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 I can do it for you. I'm not a conveyancing lawyer. Yeah. I, I need to be honest with you and tell you, Barack, and yeah, this is not my area. Yeah. Uh, call so-and-so. Right. She, she's an expert or he's an expert sort right. of thing. So even them, they'll be like, you know what? Here there'd be a conflict of interest. Please find a lawyer. So mm -hmm. I've had instances where guys say, I was told I must have a lawyer look at it and you must sign. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. So you understand there's a cost implication, what, what, what. I'm like, okay, we discuss, agree on the fee, look into the contract, give them the advice, make them understand their obligations, sign off and, and everything. So yeah. because even the investor wants to confirm that this person sort legal advice right. so that they don't have any drama in future. Right. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't understand the contract. I didn't do one, two, three. So with the, the, the foreign presence, it's really boosted. Netflix mm -hmm. is in Kenya. Uh, you know, Showmax is growing. All these people. Mm -hmm. uh, we have various players in music. Boom Play, Dundo, mm -hmm. you name them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All these guys are in the market. Mm -hmm. The artists will need lawyers. Some of these companies will also need lawyers in that jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So that's the landscape. We are using influencers now to market. So now even influencers have realized they need legal because they don't want uh, any issues. They want to ensure that they earn without, with the least drama possible and they right. can earn from multiple sources in the correct way with no legal drama. Right. So they are also coming our way and they're like, you know what, I want to protect myself and to make money. Some of them are even reading online and, and keeping themselves abreast of mm -hmm. what's happening. Because like at the time when influencers didn't think they needed lawyers, there was an influencer in the UK who was being sued by a brand mm -hmm. for contravening a contract. You know, she had a contract with one footwear company. Then the next thing, she's seen leaving a, a mall in a competing brand's shoes. Mm -hmm. And she's like, what's the problem? So, you know, now trying, some of them would say that, they're like, okay, Liz, please explain why this was an issue. Right. They let them inform them. They're like, okay, I think I need you because... I'm working more and more with brands and I need to make sure I make the right decision mm. and I work uh, professionally. I never find myself in trouble. Yeah. So a lot of, you know, film influencers and music, I think right now in my books are leading creative industries. Okay. And um, what are the things that you're looking to, uh, looking at investing, you know, what have you invested in right now? Um, where, where are you putting your, your, your money to, I guess, secure your future? Ooh, I'm still learning the investment game. I feel right. like the, the investment game is always expanding, changing, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a, a financial advisor okay. who's also a friend. Mm -hmm. um, so she's the one who's always updating me on what I can do better, what I can do differently. Mm -hmm. So 
taught me about money market mm-hmm. you know and the dollar and mm-hmm. what not all these things so she's she's always guiding me right. so she's my right hand right yeah her farm is called Larisk Africa Marianne you know actually mm-hmm. I think you should have her on this show like yeah. that chick she's we'll, sensational we'll, we'll, we'll um, get her yeah she's really awesome yeah. and, and she's been working hard to also make sure that the next generation is also appreciating you know financial so she's I'm a lawyer. I'm mathematically mm-hmm. challenged. Mm-hmm. I always tell guys that. <laughs> right. So, but she's managed to make things sound, make sense. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not bombarded with numbers. I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, is, I've understood the end game. Mm-hmm. I'm good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whatever we have done together makes sense. I'm mm-hmm. like confident because yeah. that's her forte. So, um, she's the one who helped me. She's the one who helps me navigate that yeah. space. Yeah. 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 Make sure I don't make the stupid decisions. Yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 lose and lose all, all the money that you've all the stuff you've worked for, right? Yeah, and, and I'm scared of losing money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As I sort of look towards the end, I want to ask you a little bit about um AI mm. and the creative space right now. Um do you think it's it's I know I guess I think the last couple of weeks I've seen multiple marketers talking about how much um you know with the ads that Safaricom have done with the AI generated ads and how it's taken money from the photographers the the designers the models etc um first of all generally what are your thoughts around i guess AI in the in the creative space so first of all how does AI feed right it feels from human creations right. it just doesn't it's not this thing that was just born like right. you and I and then it can do things it's actually fed by human actions right. right so once people understand it's more of an infrastructure and that they can manipulate it that it's our partner then we are home and dry yeah the challenge now is also using it responsibly and mm-hmm. honestly um because like you can see some of these images are literally derivative of already existing images right truth be told yeah so in such instances uh, when someone slaps with an infringement suit and you can see likely you know that resemblance mm-hmm. you can already i'm sure if you go back on the algorithm you will see that it actually borrowed from this image yeah. so then you owe someone so i think i mean but i mean that's a, that's a, that's a, i'd say that's a complicated thing because um and the reason why i'm saying that is if you go look at the nba the nba logo mm-hmm. um and there's a picture of i believe it's jerry west and i think for the longest time um at some point jerry west and his lawyers were trying to convince the quotes that the picture that because because on the NBA logo it's a silhouette so you can't see yeah. who it is just a person with a with a basketball and they tried to con- they tried to convince the courts that it's him and they haven't been able to I mean if you look the, if you look at the pictures yeah <laughs> right next to you they're like yeah this is exactly yeah so what but you is. see it's also understanding yeah um, first of all AI is also coexisting the different IP regimes right, right. copyright trademark all mm-hmm. these things mm-hmm. so whatever you will also as one to assert there will yeah. be those things that you need like copyright to yeah. be about substantial similarity yeah. issue of access and all that for you to prove copyright infringement right yeah. so like i said that's why we need to be honest about how we use it mm-hmm. right and and if you see that yeah we here have infringed then just own up and do the needful mm-hmm. but i would say i think it's a tool that we can use to collaborate and i don't think it will take uh, anything from anyone if anything mm-hmm. i i feel like it will build Mm-hmm. And I think Moab recently just did a a video of some sorts yeah. on his IG and he he said it out correctly that if we at understand it mm-hmm. and use it better then it you know we will we not lose out yeah. it will not take away any jobs yeah. from us it's the same thing even for us in the legal industry we are trying to figure out like personally I'm trying to leg- figure out how I will make it make sense so that I I don't f- get replaced or feel I'm yeah. replaced by I AI. mean if, if I go now and ask ChatGPT <laughs> to give me a basic um uh IP contract it, it 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 will. Yeah, it will likely do that. Yeah. Yeah. So do you feel threatened at all? No, I'm not threatened yeah. because you will still need that set of eyes to make sure that it's legally sound in your jurisdiction. Yeah. Right? But that means that you charge me less. If I come if I come to you with like a draft of something and I'm like could you please then um, then there's a service like there's different services yeah. there with the legal drafting and legal review right yeah and like for me when when someone comes with a, a contract they drafted themselves I'll be like did you draft it how did you because I assess the kind mm-hmm. of work that's likely to uh, yeah. come my way because some some of it might be faulty mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. so it will depend and then just a quick perusal I'll be able to tell okay yeah. this one <laughs> 
we're talking about more money than what you expected because yeah. I can see you have all the clauses wrong, you have following clauses missing, yeah. all these things. You didn't factor in the following issues because you see also, uh, chat GPT, what it will do, it will give you the basic, mm -hmm. right? But you see a contract is supposed to be specific to your issue, your industry, the work at hand. Yeah. And there'll be some things that chat GPT can't foresee. Yeah. That's what a lawyer does for you, yeah. right? They're able to say, oh, if you, if you actually negotiated one, two, three, you'll make more money yeah. or you'll have an opportunity to get a second contract, you know, things like that. Yeah. Chat GPT won't tell you that, yeah. right? So it will just give you a basic contract. Yeah. But the, the essence of any contract is to build a business. When you get into a contractual deal, it's about making money here and moving to the next level. How do I get more opportunities? ChatGPT won't do that for you. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, last question. Um, through all the different settlements that you've, um, I guess, had without, I guess, necessarily telling us who the clients have been, mm -hmm. what's been the biggest IP settlement that, that, that you've made in, this, in, this, in the Kenyan jurisdiction? Um, that would be, there's one I secured for a client, six million. Okay. Um, with a Silicon Valley company. And that was a big deal because unfortunately the client was shafted at the beginning of the project, mm -hmm. but we could uh, see the copyright, uh, you know, all the, we could assert that we could see where the work had come from, the yeah. inspiration and everything. Yeah. So even though they were removed from the equation, the fact that they had been in the they were one of the first people who were consulted in the process. And mm -hmm. it's what they brought to the table that built the asset for me was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Six million. Okay. Yeah. Not and then I think it's always, it always feels nice when you go after a big law. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you think, so you see, I mean, we we're talking about this before we started. You, you're a believer that there's enough um, market to go around um, for IP work, whether it's as an artist, whether you're, um, you know, created new technology, there's enough work around for pe for people in IP law to be able to make money purely from IP and make a good living. Yeah, there's enough. How many people are starting businesses every day? Yeah, there are many. Every business, it doesn't have to be a creative business, needs or has IP. Yeah, right. Um, say a, an accounting business, for example. Yeah, right. Um. The format for accounting or, or um, the methodologies are, yeah. not, are not protected, right? But maybe you're an account of serious standing. You've learned a few tricks along the game. Those are trade secrets, yeah. right? So contracts, right? Um, you create that brand. You need to register the trademark so that you stand out as an auditor from the others. Also, again, as, as people understand that their brands are also assets, how they stand out, you yeah. know, more businesses learn that then there's more you know unfortunately ip is underappreciated at the moment yeah right and then people isolated to see to think that only do you think that the market the is still not ready still young for i think the appreciation of ip it's just not many people talking about it i think we need another ten thousand leases mm -hmm. everywhere to talk about it right for different because again also it's about how you package mm -hmm. how i'll package ip to a scientist is going to be different from how I'll package IP to someone in the media space, right? Yeah. But they all need IP. They yeah. all have IP. They all generate IP. Everyone starts a business with their idea. Yeah. IP is about protecting the expressions of the mind. Yeah. It's about what do you have and how do we protect it? Yeah. Oh, it's a patent. Okay. It's a trademark. It's a copyright. Okay. So the minute that people understand that, there's a lot. But at the pace that we are going at now, assuming there's one lease in the market, mm -hmm. how many years do you think it will take us <laughs> to get to a place where the market is like, yeah, um, Justin's here is doing his work, his work needs to be protected. How long will it take for him? Justin, do you have your IP sorted out? Yeah, see? <laughs> That's it. Um, it. You know, I think whenever we have foreigners coming into the market, yeah. there's usually a surge. Okay. You know, like when someone hears, oh, there's this fashion brand coming to the, the Kenyan market. And someone's like, oh my gosh, but then my brand almost sounds like theirs. I think I should register mine because IP is territory. Mm. So and then if you're too little, too late, uh, there's also like for trademarks, we have the Madrid system. Yeah. So you may find that even that name now is no longer available because they registered through Madrid. Mm. They designated Kenya. Mm. They appointed Kenya as a country of protection. Now you're the one who has to go and rebrand because okay. you are not quick and smart in the beginning. Okay. And people never understand that. Yeah. I think... Uh, and, when and what you're saying is happening to enough people because I think, like for me also, to be honest, as I'm sitting here, I'm a little bit skeptical because I'm like, yeah, I hear what you're saying, mm -hmm. but really that must be like one in, I don't know, like a hundred. 
so what are the odds that will happen to me and it's it's you know it's happening i mean why if, if i talk to give like case case examples there yeah. are many uh i'll give one um what's what's Barclay's new name now absa absa yeah so like there's a guy who had registered absa here <laughs> yeah. yeah many many years back yeah. before absa had rebranded I'm not sure what this guy's motivation was, but yeah. him, he had a brand. Called so, Absa. Yeah, and I think eventually what happened is he had either to buy or something. I think he's ended up being a trademark spotting something. Mm. But now you can imagine that there are those who you have a brand, right? You start a business, you it has a similar connotation to an international brand. And then um, at some point, maybe you might decide, ah, I'm done, I'm bored with this thing. But then this other brand, international brand comes in, they need the trademark. So they'll come to you, you sell it to them. Yeah. So you've made money. Right, and then you walk away and smiling to the bank. Something, yeah. um, some other businesses have ended up also buying uh, uh, trademarks from others because of that. Yeah, like iPhone. iPhone is usually a classic example I give my my clients whenever they come to register a trademark. Because when you're starting a business, sometimes you're like, I think I will want to also mm. manufacture belts, but mm. now I just want to to create, you know, sell shoes right. or I'm right. creating garments right right and i tell them belts are part of the fashion space right yeah. you might do it in a year's time but let's secure that class now because yeah. the trademarks we have classes uh when iphone registered their trademark they, at the time they never foresaw that they would need phone covers and right. casings so some chinese brand registered iphone in the class for leather the, goods right. and whatnot so they they had a suit iphone also you don't have a case because you're not in the same class yeah. da, da, da. so they ended up i think having a commercial agreement so they essentially license that now. Yeah, now they license. And wow. I think we always have to believe in our ideas. Yeah. I think that's the one thing us we don't do. When you look yeah. at the internationals, the Chinese, the Americans, the Europeans, you'll find that most of these guys, when they create, immediately they move to protect the asset. Yeah. And they are ready to say, you know what, I'll invest, protect it. If it makes money, well and good. If it doesn't, it may not make money now, there's probably a long game. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Lots to talk about there. I think I think we'll definitely we'll definitely have you back. Definitely have you back to delve into that licensing space. But this has been yeah, this has been something. <laughs> I, I I don't know, maybe you know, I, I maybe I'll revive my law career and, and, and come into the IP space. <laughs> 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 maybe I will, but that's been really good. Um really enjoyed having you here. I'm um, sure we'll have you back again. We'll organize that with Shiko. This has been financially incorrect and We'll see you guys on the next episode.